know why. It's not the church. The Gateway Church is a wonderful place. They love the preaching. The music was just right up their alley. It's not the people. The greeters did a great job. They were friendly. They were gracious. The ushers were kind and helpful. The children's ministry was was great, safe and clean and and well attended to, and the kids were spiritually fed. And they even experienced God in the service on Sunday morning. They, They would say that they experienced the presence of God in their life. What was the problem for Josh and Crystal? Well, the problem is they never connected to us as a body. How many know that a crowd can be a lonely place sometimes? You can be with a whole group of people and feel all alone. People talking, people laughing, but you're kind of on the outside looking in, having nothing to talk about, having nothing, no connection, nothing to cry about or laugh about. And you know what's interesting? Our society kind of feeds us that line a lot. There we kind of highlight isolation and individualism and consumerism. Our society thrives on some of those things. But for Josh and Crystal... In order for them to stick, they needed some kind of connecting point, a connection, a building of community, an assimilation into who we are. And this morning, I want to talk about making room in our lives for fellowship and what that means. And that's why we started with a song about leaning on each other and when we're not strong. And it's just not a good idea for us. Fellowship, connecting people in community is not an an option. It's a biblical mandate. And the biblical term or the the idea is called oneness. And we're going to talk about that this morning. I want you to turn with me to John chapter 17 in uh, in God's Word. And we're going to start there and uh, it'll be kind of our main text. It's interesting, this particular text comes after Jesus uh, talked about uh, uh, being... Uh, the fruit, uh, the vine and the branches that we're connected with the Father, that if we're going to be fruitful in our lives, we need to be grafted in, part of the vine. We need Jesus in our lives. And then he talks about uh, in chapter 15 uh, of John that the world hates the disciples and uh, that, that the world from the outside, there is going to be attack. There's going to be trouble uh, that kind of comes along. And then, of course, chapter 16. If you have not read John chapter 16, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's a powerful, powerful uh, chapter. And, uh, and then he comes to chapter 17. He says, after all this, Jesus looked toward heaven and he prayed. Aren't you thankful that Jesus set a model to pray? And he prayed not only for himself at the beginning. He says, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son that your son may, be, may glorify you. And he goes on and prays for himself. And then he prays for his disciples, those that were a part of his ministry at that time. But then he comes to chapter 17, verse 20, and listen to what it says. It says, my prayer is not for them alone, not just for the disciples, not just for me, But he says, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, through the disciples as they reach out after Jesus ascends into heaven, which right after this, uh, Jesus is going to be arrested and and, uh, taken to trial and ended up on a cross and beat and bruised and and, uh, is crucified for us. Then he knows that, but he says, look, I pray for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them, that includes us, all believers, may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. Verse 23, I in them and you in me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Then let's listen, let's finish up the prayer. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, 
though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. A powerful, passionate prayer. Jesus knew what was coming, and he said before he was arrested, he said to the disciples and prayed to, prayed to his Father in heaven, he said, God, my desire is for all believers to be one, one in body, one in spirit, to be together. And that's our prayer this morning as we talk about making room for more fellowship. Let's pray over God's word. Lord, your word speaks to us. It's powerful and effective. Lord, I pray that it would not just be words on a page, but Lord, that it would pierce into our hearts and it would challenge us. It would take us to a new place. God, perhaps a place we've been before, perhaps a place that we've never been. But Lord, we just honor you this morning for who you are. Speak to us and we will give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, this morning, how many of our parents have kids? Just uh, slip up your hand. Lots of us. There's many of us that are here. You know, as parents, we will often make our kids do things that they don't want to do. You know what I'm talking about? Things that are good for them, but they would rather not do them. And we make them brush their teeth, for example. We make boys change their underwear, for example, because <laughs> Lord knows there's no need, right? Just turn it inside out. We make our kids do their homework or practice an instrument or eat their vegetables, right? And we do that because we love our kids. And I was talking about this with my parents just last night. Called them up and was telling them how I wanted to kind of start the message. And, and uh, I, I know this will be a shock to some of you, but I was not a perfect kid growing up. I know, I know. It's a big, I, I'm, I'm closer to perfection today, maybe. No, no. But I wasn't. And, you know, my parents at times had to make me do things that I didn't want to do, but it was good for me. And I asked my parents, help me remember some of these things. And my mom, the first thing that came to her mind, she said, well, you remember the time when you and your buddies snuck into the movie theater, didn't pay for the movie? We found out. Do you remember what we made you do? And I was like, yes, I remember. Well, I didn't want to write a letter to the company, to the uh, theater. I didn't want to go and to give them the letter with double the payment. But my mom and dad knew they had to set an example and say, you know what, we don't want this pattern to be established in your life. And they made me do something I did not want to do, but it was good for me to do that. And I remember writing out that letter saying, I'm sorry, me and my buddies, we slipped in. Here's double the payment. And it was a learning experience in my life. Another time, my mom said, do you remember the time when, uh, and she couldn't remember what I did wrong, but it must have been bad because she gave me this big uh, shopping bag, brown paper bag, and she said, I don't want you to come into this house until this uh, bag is full of weeds to the top. And I, I, I said, yeah, I kind of remember that. And I had to pick weeds, and they made sure I got the roots. And if I didn't, I was in trouble. You had to get the roots, get them out. And I'm thinking, why didn't we just use Weed Be Gone? Well, I was the Weed Be Gone at that moment, okay? And they, they made me do that. Again, it was something I didn't want to do, but it was good for me to learn. My parents made me do it. I didn't like it, but it was good for me. All right, so you tracking with me? Now, as your pastor, as I think about fellowship and what that means, I have a desire. I would even say it borders on frustration at times. A holy discontent to see people, you guys, us, together outside of these four walls. Fellowship. Over the last six years, if there's been something that's been kind of a highlight, a desire of mine, I would love to see grow, is that you guys would not just come on Sunday mornings, but would be together more than that. 
You say, well, why is that so important? Why is that desire so deep that you would call it a frustration or a holy discontent? And the reason is because there is no discipleship without relationships. Let me say that again. There is no discipleship unless there is relationship built. How do we get people together? How do we get us to want to be together? It's a challenge. How many of you have ever heard of George Gallup, the Gallup polls that he, he puts out over the years? Well, a couple years back, it's actually several years ago, he did a study, and the study said that 70% of Americans say that the church, the church, not a particular church, the church is not meeting the needs of Americans. And as they distilled that down and said, well, what are the needs that you have as individuals in America? This is what they said. Number one, to believe life is meaningful and has purpose. How many would say that you have that fundamental need in your life? That you want to know that life has meaning and that there's a purpose to why we're existing, why we're breathing this oxygen. We're not here by accident. And that was the number one thing. The second thing was to have a sense of community and deeper relationships. Isn't that interesting? The third thing was to be appreciated and respected. Number four was to be listened to and to be heard. How many would agree with that, that that's important? You want people to listen, to engage, to be heard, that your ideas matter in those types of things. Number five was that a need of people when they considered uh, connecting with the church was to grow in faith. And they, they weren't being, 70% said that that need wasn't being fulfilled. And then the sixth key was to receive practical help in developing a mature faith. Isn't that interesting? When you look at that list of six things, five out of six, or really even six out of six, come as a result of closeness or togetherness. No wonder Jesus prayed, God, oh, that they would be one in John 17. Let's look at those verses again in John 17. The key verses for me, when we look at this, is 21 and 22 and 23. Listen to what it says. Well, let's just start at 20. It says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will be believing in this message, or believe me through their message, that all of them may be one. Everyone say one. Father, that just as you are in me and I in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. It's important to Jesus as he was praying, saying, God, I desire for my people, the body of Christ, to be together as one. Verse 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me. That Why? That they may be one as we are one. He uses himself as an example, saying, God, we are Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three persons in one being, perfect unity. And he says, that's how I want the church to be, in perfect unity. I and them and you and me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. A heart cry of Jesus, our Savior, for us to be together, to be one. But you know what? In America, unfortunately, in many cases, and maybe even in your case, the church has been reduced to a Sunday morning attendance and a check off the list, did that, been there. And you know what? That really is not the church. Can I say that? <laughs> A church family is at its best when it's a small enough to sit around a circle, facing each other, sharing joy and the benefits of being together. And the goal for us as we continue to grow as a body of believers, and as we continue to seek the face of God, is to provide opportunities so people can get close enough to know each other. Close enough to care and to share to challenge and to support, to confide in one another, to confess our sins one to another, to forgive, to be forgiven, to laugh and to weep together, to be accountable to each other, to watch over each other, to grow together. 
What are we talking about? We're talking about fellowship, being together. Because the bottom line is that personal growth does not happen in isolation. Our Christian walk is not a walk by ourselves. It's a walk together. Spiritual growth and character grow out of interactive relationships. And they don't happen by accident. It needs to be intentional. The oneness of God's people coming together. And of course, a greatest place to look is the model of the early church. And of course, there's models in the, in the, New, or the Old Testament as well. Uh, people being together, um, the temple, uh, they would come and worship. And, and not only would they just worship, uh, but they would take it back to their homes, Old Testament model. And really, Acts chapter 2 was a continuation of that model. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2, and let's start in verse 42, listen to what the church represented or what they were able to accomplish together, the fellowship of the believers. You've probably heard this before, and I, I said to myself as I, was, as I was preparing, I know we've, we've looked at these verses before because one of our goals is to connect not only with God, but with each other, right? That's the fellowship. That's, we've talked about that for years and then connect with the world. But when we talk about connecting with each other, we often start here. But listen to what it says. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, being together, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Then listen, 43, Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together 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 and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods. They gave to anyone who had need. Listen to this, 46. If this doesn't challenge you, it certainly does to me. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added their numbers daily, those that were being saved. Pretty incredible example, the early church being together. You flip over to the next chapter, chapter 4, verse 32, it says this, all the believers were in one heart and in one mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. Let me just give you an example of what that would be like. Let me see, who could I pick on this morning? Oh, you know what? I forgot my wallet. It's in my car, but that's okay. Rick, <laughs> Rick, let me see your wallet for a second. You don't care? Well, let me see that wad of cash you got. Because <laughs> yeah, you just put it in an offering. All right, who, who has a wallet? Rick, you got your wallet on you? All right. It says they shared, right? So, I mean, I'm a, I left mine out in the, uh, and I, wanted, I felt like I wanted to bless uh, Samantha up here. And so... So no problem, right? That's what it meant. <laughs> Put it on there. Just charge it. It's fine. Pay for it later. So when it says that they were there together, no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had with great power. The apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them. There were no needy persons among them. Isn't that powerful? Wow. No one was needy around them. For from time to time, those who owned land and houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. It was distributed to anyone who had a need. The, they were together. Turn to one more, or a couple more here. Uh, Acts chapter 5. You know, it's talking about... Uh, the, the apostles, they left the Sanhedrin, verse 41, rejoicing because they had been counted it worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. How often do we say, hey, praise God, I got persecuted today. Well, they, they did, the early church. But then listen to what it says. It says, day after day in the temple courts, so that was church, right? The, a large gathering. And from house to house, so smaller groups, face to face, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. One more. Turn with me to Acts chapter 20, verse, uh, well, let's start in verse 18. This is Paul's farewell to the, uh, to the uh, elders at Ephesus. And he says to them, 
Uh, he says, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility, with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. Verse 20, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you first, listen what it says, publicly, large group, and from house to to house. I have declared both Jews and to the Gentiles that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. There was a pattern set in early scripture. The early church expanded with large and small group type gatherings. It's important for us to see that. What does our context look like here? Sunday mornings. What's the purpose of being here this morning? It's a celebration service, right? A time to be in unity, connected by common goals and vision. And you know what's interesting? We are really only limited growth-wise by the size of our facility. That's why we've gone to two services and asking God for more. But we're connected in both services by unity of doctrine by mutual understanding of God and God's glory expressed through the gospel. That's why we're here, to lift Jesus up, to worship him together in spirit and in truth. And that's what the the Bible calls our worship experience. And so whether we're 70 people or 170 or 7,000 people, for that matter, the goal is to worship God, to bring his word forward, and uh, and we want to do that well. But the fact is, is that the average person, unless you're like super uh, abnormal, the average person will have a natural affinity group that will include no more than 70 individuals. 70 people to know by name in a setting like this. That's what statistics say across America and really across the world. About 70 people that you can kind of, you know, get your mind around, you know, kind of know a little bit about. And what's interesting is that... Even at that, we still need to look for opportunities to be smaller. We must provide connecting points outside of Sunday mornings to be together. Because if we grow like we're believing God to grow to 250, we need to continue to be small so we are together and we are strong. I was thinking about this. My wife is in the back. She's working the PowerPoint, looking beautiful back there. And uh, isn't she doing a great job this morning? Yeah. She's awesome. Well, you know, her birthday is at the end of this month. Should I tell them how old you're going to be? 29. Her birthday's on the 31st. She's a Halloween baby every year. (laughs) Yeah. Really. (laughs) That's why she's got red hair. Orange is red hair. No. But you know what I was thinking about? You know, the reason her birthday is special, and we'll celebrate this year, and we'll do something nice, and we've got some gifts on the way already, and uh, it's kind of neat. She, she's wanted a, a, a what, it's like a gold, or not, like a silver wedding ring, right? And so she, you know, with, you know, how, I mean, one ring is good enough, you know, for me. But, you know, she's saying, hey, when I wear silver jewelry, I'd like to have a silver ring. And so we got one that's on, on its way, and uh, it's kind of fun. And the reason, though, that, that celebration it is important and significant is because of the relationship that we have, that our family has. And we want to highlight and honor Jessica in a really powerful way. But let's say, you know, we got together, you know, we saw each other maybe, you know, just once a week and didn't, you know, see each other throughout the week or, you know, and, and then their birthday came around and I was like, well, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, you know, let's show, let's show up. I'll, I'll throw a party. Come on, everybody. Uh, would that have the same amount of significance? Probably not. Think about your kids. The reason that they love their birthdays is because, not because of so much, well, it is because of the gifts. Let's not be... Uh, <laughs> But it's also, they don't, may not realize it, but it's because of the connection that you have with them. It brings significance. And as we make room for more fellowship, it's bringing significance to our celebration on Sunday morning. You tracking with me? 
that if we are together through the week or through the month, and then we come together to worship together, it's that much more sweet. God's hand, He helps us. He sweetens the deal. And I'm not talking about adding things into your life for most of us. I'm convinced that if we would just do what we're already doing with a little intentionality, that we will see growth in this area of fellowship. So you say, Pastor, where are we headed with this? Well, for this fall, if you turn in your bulletins, which I want you to do, kind of save this for this time, there are connecting points in our bulletin that are important for you to realize. Wednesday nights is one of those times that we can be together around the table, share each other's needs, uh, pray for each other, and those types of things. We've doubled our services. We're going to two services starting today. And by the way, thanks for coming to first service. We think that's awesome and keep on coming. But you know what? We want times to be together, sitting around tables. We've got one of those opportunities at the end of this month, October 27th. We're going to have a missions banquet on a Saturday night. And we want all of you to be there. This week, you're going to get an invitation in the mail. We're going to need to know, so we're going to have a catered in and it's going to be beautiful. We've got a guest speaker that night. It's going to be a great time. We've also got some ladies crafts nights that are coming up. Six to nine o'clock every other Tuesday beginning October 30th. We've got a men's breakfast this fall. We've got a women's brunch at the beginning of December. And then of course we've got some ministry opportunities together. Journey to Bethlehem Outreach. You'll be hearing about that over the next few weeks. Uh, December 6th, 7th, and 8th. And then also of course At the end of the year, we've got a hygiene drive, a chance to be together, to give out to our community. And these are things that are important to us, and it will help us to connect in fellowship outside of Sunday mornings. But then, when January hits, we're believing, God, for something greater than what we've had. We want to make room for more fellowship. And what I want us to do here this morning is to help us in that process as we think ahead till to uh, January. Everyone that came in should have got one of these cards. If you didn't, I'd like you to raise your hand real quick. And uh, Chris Berg, if you could uh, stand up real quick, and uh, there should be some extra on the... Did anybody not get one of these? Okay, we got uh, one over here, a couple up here. So just a couple around. If you could make sure that each of us get one of those. What I want us to do is I want us to think about what kind of things in our lives energize us every month. Things that energize you. And, you, and I know some of you are like, man, I, if I come up with one thing that energizes me, that'd be good. But come up with as many as you can. Things that energize you that you do every month. Then I want you to consider what is one thing that you would like to learn about and why and fill that out. Put your name on it. And then we're just going to leave those at our chairs. And so I'm going to give you a couple minutes because what we're talking about here is creating opportunities come January for us to be together every week, every month, every quarter, to build community, to connect with each other, to assimilate each other. Because, you know, the story of Josh and Crystal that I told you at the beginning, those people aren't real. Thank God. Where they didn't connect Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? You, you thought it was Josh. Sorry, Josh, not you. But you know what? The reality is, is that could happen. We want to eliminate those opportunities. So we're saying, hey, Josh, he likes to play tennis, and he, got, he joins a couple guys on a Thursday night to play tennis. And Crystal says, oh, there's a, a group of ladies that meet uh, that I have young kids, and uh, they just go and sip coffee, and uh, that's one of the things they enjoy to do. It energizes them, and she, she meets up on a Tuesday morning for coffee with some ladies, and then they come the next Sunday, and what happens? They're like, hey, man, you killed me on the, on the court, or boy, you know, I'm sore from, you know, swinging that racket, or whatever, or hey, we saw you. Co- through co- there's a connecting point. It's so important. So anyway, take a few minutes. Let's put some music on just here for a second. We want to take time right in service, and then you're going to leave those. We'll collect those at the end of the service, uh, between services. And we're asking God, we're asking God for connecting points. And this will help us because we want to be one together.
couple more minutes. A few more minutes. you to do, I want you to take this, and I want you to put it underneath your chair, don't put it in your Bible, don't put it in your purse, ladies, we want you to leave this, and we'll collect them after service, uh, after we exit, and we want to take these and look for common connection points of things that we could provide as a church, uh, for that things that you're already doing that energize you, but we could be intentional about it, coming together and making those connections on a monthly or a weekly or once a quarter type basis. Building community, connecting people together. And the reason is because God, He calls us, He desires, He's prayed for it, that we would be one. Now, I would love if I could just force you, like a loving parent, to do this. And I've talked with some of you about this before. You come on Sunday mornings and that's about it or whatever. You know, if we just became like a little communist uh, dictatorship, a new church growth model, pastor makes you get together, you know, right? You know, you'd be like, bye bye <laughs> But... uh I know that it would be good for you. And I'm not your parent. <laughs> but I would love to encourage. You say, why? Because there's something. We can, be, we can be taught in a corporate setting. We can be encouraged in a corporate setting and exhorted, even corrected or rebuked in a corporate type setting from a distance. But real discipleship, which we're actually going to talk about next week. It's the, the last piece or last arrow, discipleship. Real discipleship only takes place if we take time to get connected and to develop relationships. You know, Jesus was a great example. He modeled that for us. He didn't just pull his disciples and say, hey, follow me. And uh, I'll, you know, he said, I'll teach you to not only, uh, we're not fishing for fish anymore, but I'm gonna, we're going to be fishing for men. And he didn't say, hey, I'll see you, you know, once a month, or I'll see you, you know, once a quarter, or even once a week for that matter. He walked with the disciples. He talked with his disciples, and he was a great, great example. And my heart for you this morning is that your heart would grow, that you would see the need for this type of fellowship, this type of connection in your life you would see the need. The reality is that it can be hard to fit into church life at times. Would you agree? It can be hard to get involved. It can be hard to connect, to be connected with others in church community. Maybe you've been burned in the past, and so you're a little reluctant to just jump right in. Or you say, I'm not interested in that. Uh, Sunday morning's enough. Or maybe it's your time. It literally, you, know, you just you know, have, have very little time outside of your regular activities. How many would agree that there are true obstacles that we all face when it comes to being together? And that's the truth of it. We're busy people. 
And sometimes I think the enemy is behind it. He would love to isolate us, to consider, a, you know, to say, hey, you don't need anybody. But I would say, my heart for us is that we would not be isolated. We would not highlight individualism. But our prayer, like Christ's prayer, would be that we would become one. No lone rangers. How many agree that's a sad existence to be all alone? Yeah. It's not God's plan. It's not our plan as a church. You know, when I look at the days of my life, the 36 years that I've been living and breathing, and my years of relationship with people, whether I was as, as a student or in college, being young married, in ministry, uh, I've got these John 17 groups, in marriage, there have been connecting points along the way for me, whether it's basketball or motorcycles or Bible studies or getting together to play cards. And these connecting points for me and for my family have provided opportunities for us to be healthy. And I believe that you will be more healthy as we make room, as you decide, saying, you see the need, saying, yep, that's me. I want to make room for more fellowship in my life. This morning, I want to close by offering the gift of salvation to those that may not have made a commitment to Christ. But you know what? I want to make sure, especially this morning, as we talk about fellowship, that we're not offering you a relationship with Jesus and then saying, okay, bye-bye, we'll see you later. Go and do it on your own. But I want to offer not only a relationship with Jesus, but a relationship with a healthy church body that will love you, walk with you, support you. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, or maybe you served God at one point in your life, but it's been a while and you're coming back to the Lord, you're saying, boy, I, I realize the need in my life for Jesus. This morning, we're offering that. It's the gift of salvation. With everyone's head bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. If that's you this morning, you're saying, boy, that's where I am today. I need Jesus in my life. Would you just slip up your hand right where you are? Yeah, thanks. One young man, anyone else saying, yep, that's me? Say, look at my life. I need Jesus in my life. You can put your hand down. Anyone else? And that's me. In just a moment, we're going to pray. But for the rest of us, and including the one that raised his hand, do you see the need? A heart is your heart to grow in fellowship, making room for more fellowship. If you're saying, Pastor, this morning, I see the need for me, for you individually, to be connected at some level outside of these four walls, would you just slip up your hand right where you are if you see that need in your life and say, yep, that's me. I, I understand what God's, God's call on my life. I'm not saying that you have to even be connected to this church, but just saying, hey, I need, if, if, in order for me to grow in the Lord, I need to be connected with other believers. Just slip up your hand, yeah. Hands everywhere. I want us all to stand this morning, and I want to pray that God would help us grow in this area. And that God would help us to not only make a priority for some of these events this fall, missions banquet or uh, you know, men's breakfast or a women's brunch or other. There's a family activity uh, in November that's going to be a blast on a Friday night, a kind of an all-family game night. That'll be fun. Not only to make those a priority, but that we would even start today, that you'd get out the church directory that you might have or connect with someone on the way out saying, hey, let's get together this week, call someone up, see how they're doing, that you would take the initiative and that God would use you to bless someone else. Because when you start to give in that way, the blessing comes back to you and it is a blessing. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for all that you're doing. 
for the way you're challenging us. And God, the way that your word challenges us even today. Lord, I pray that your hand would be upon us and God, that you would open our hearts to see the need that we must be together more than just on Sunday morning celebration. But Lord, that you would cause us to desire to be together, to grow together, to keep each other accountable, to love each other, to call out each other when we're wrong, to, to, to be able to laugh and weep together, to forgive and to be forgiven to watch out, to grow together, to share and to care for each other. Lord, I pray that you would provide those opportunities even this week. We pray it in Jesus' wonderful name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. God bless you as you go. That's how we're going to end today. Leave those cards. We will collect those. But go in the grace of God and... Make sure this morning that you're connecting with someone outside of Sunday mornings. Amen. Call out your name.